Yeah, it was interesting because I had a pretty good knowledge on race directing in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I got this. I can do this. No worries. <laughs> yeah, I was I was so wrong because it's a it's a totally different mentality. It's it's like very different. In Europe, yes, very different. Oh yeah, like for yes. example, point to point. Mm -hmm. Here it's good. The big races, point to point, they're, they're really popular. Not so much in Switzerland. They, mm -hmm. for some reason, like loops and stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have showers at the finish, you're in trouble in Switzerland. There's a race track. <laughs> I learned that. Uh, I've done over. I've done 108 ultra marathons, and I had two showers and finish. <laughs> That's <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, it's that it was a big learning curve. <laughs> Hello, hello. Hey, everyone. We are back with another Gotta Run podcast. Indeed we are. Deep in the throes of Canadian winter. How's your training coming along for the Slovenia 60K coming up? Pretty good. Pretty good. I did a uh, hill climb on the treadmill at the gym yesterday. First time ever getting to 20% incline. No hands. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I found interesting was the fact that my heart rate, during a run, my heart rate's around 148 to 150. Comfortable, right? Comfortable breathing. Yep. Yet climbing on the treadmill, I was not running, I was climbing at a 20% incline, gave me the same heart rate, but my perceived exertion <laughs> was much harder than if I was just running on the road. And why do you think that is? Well, I don't understand the science, <laughs> but obviously... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to be uh, having some difficult weathers coming soon, so it looks like we'll be on the treadmill more often. We never did give that question to each other, prefer minus 20 or a treadmill run. So what would you prefer? Minus 20, if without wind. Yes, you have to be very specific. <laughs> sunny, I, sunny minus 20. Yeah, I would take minus 20. Sunny, no wind. Over a treadmill. Over a treadmill. Any day of the week. Okay. All right. Oh, well, we'll keep you informed. And uh, I, once again, we'd like to thank our Patreon supporters. Yes, big thanks. Big thanks. And you can head on over to patreon.com to check us out for just a gel a month. You can support us through Patreon. That's right. And we really appreciate it. And it helps us with upgrading our equipment. And keeping the ball rolling. Yeah. And making our broadcast more professional. Well, we're trying. We're trying. We are. We are. <laughs> Who is on the podcast today? Today we have Jacob Herman. He's a Swiss living in California. He's lived in California for quite a few years, actually. Very experienced runner with an incredible number of races under his belt, including 79 marathons, over 50 50Ks, and 2,500 milers. His very first ultra was back in 2005 at the JFK 50. Hey, go big or go home. You got it. <laughs> of course, he's also done Javelina a few times, Rio de Largo, Man vs. Horse, which looks pretty interesting, and a couple Western States uh, attempts <laughs> that didn't quite end well. So we'll try and ask him about that. But he's also the race director of the Swiss Alps 100, which we... Yeah, which is getting a lot of uh, attention these days. And we first heard about it, I think, from Aaron Shimmons, who, who we chatted with back in October. That's right. That's right. Yeah, Irish Aaron. The race is a qualifier for three of North America's biggest races, Hard Rock, Western, and Badwater. And in addition, the male and female winners of the 100-miler earn a guaranteed entry into Badwater. Better sign up early for Swiss Alps 100, because I'm sure it's going to be selling out in the future very quickly. I wonder how he's able to achieve this in such a short time because this race is relatively new. Right. And to get Western and Hard Rock and Badger all on board. Well. There's only five in the world that has a race like that, that has all those three qualifications. Wow. 
Very interesting. Yeah. Well, we're going to find out. Stick around. And here's Jacob coming up. So, Jacob, welcome to the podcast. We can't wait to dive into, obviously, the Swiss Alps 100, which you're a race director of. But before we do that, we want to learn about more how you got into this crazy sport of ultra running. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you guys finally. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good story, actually. Yeah, I've, I've actually, like always hated running in school they made me run in school like you know and uh, I didn't like it at all and then after school I um I didn't do sports for 20 years nothing wow and I was always fine but once I came to the United States and I was going to college had no money uh McDonald's was my best friend <laughs> <laughs> so I gained a lot of weight so I had to do something started to run on treadmills which I wasn't too happy about it. And then one day I had this crazy idea, why not go outside? <laughs> so I went outside running and something clicked. And yeah, I got in really quick, like like within a, probably six months, I ran a 50 mile and then the year after 100 mile and it just clicking away. Like it just, from there on, it was just fun all the way. Mm. Well, Swiss uh, Alps is definitely a tough one. It's over 10,000 yeah. meters of climbing and a cutoff of 49 hours. So it's obviously well-deserved. If you finish that race, you should be prepared for almost anything. What's the origin yeah. story of Swiss Alps 100? Um, yeah, it's a good story too. Um, kind of a silly start, uh, how, how it all began, because um, obviously I'm in Southern California. My parents are in Switzerland. So the, they kept visiting us and we once in a while went visiting them. And then uh, in 2015, uh, we did a cruise and they said they're getting too old. They don't want to travel that far anymore. And so I was like, oh, OK, yeah, I understand. Yeah, they're getting close to 80 and mm -hmm. back then. And then uh, I was thinking like, well, I won't be able to go back every year because I have a family of six. It's really expensive. And obviously you want to see other places too than just Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So at that point I was looking heavily for doing my own race in Southern California, but I just couldn't find a good location and everything. It's just, there were so many races and everything. Then suddenly one day I'm like, why not do a race in Switzerland? So I, uh, <laughs> had that idea i know the core i know the, the the hiking path i know the area everything but i never really thought to give it a big chance to it it's more like okay then then i can do that every year and i, I travel back i can visit my my family there and just combine everything in that way right and uh, so yeah i started working on it and and uh had the first race in 2017 well, you must have known some key people in Switzerland that were willing to help you get this race off the ground, I would imagine. Yeah, well, it was mostly me at the beginning. And uh, my brother <laughs> helped me a lot too, right? And honestly, like a race, uh, 90% is you can do on a, on a computer those days. Mm -hmm. the thing like from the cores to, to permissions and everything. So, yeah. Uh, thankfully, what really saved me is in Switzerland, uh, the hiking path are really well maintained. Right. Like, you can always uh, rest assured they, they're well, like, during the winter, they get damaged, and then they instantly go and fix it and everything. So that's the good part. So right. So I don't have to be worried about it. So the rest, yeah. Yeah. Um, can you describe the course for the 100 a little bit? Because I understand you go over, what, three suspension bridges and you run along a glacier. So just paint the picture yeah. for the listeners. We want to get them excited yeah. to check you out. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So, well, the start is interesting. It's very similar to Western State. I mean, you start and you go right uphill, a big climb through first aid station, and then you run towards... Uh, it's called a uh, Riederfurka. And uh, during that time, you have to, that, that's just 160. You get to the first uh, suspension bridge, mm -hmm. which they can cross and experience that. 
then they do a big loop and coming back they go through a big dam an alpine dam mm. nearly on the dam itself they are able to run it that's cool coming back uh they have quite some distance along the glacier it's the alec glacier mm -hmm. it's the biggest glacier in uh swiss alps oh wow uh, mm -hmm. yeah it's like uh, 13 miles long holy cow that's so a half that's... marathon <laughs> Yeah, 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 total glacier, yeah, but uh, the distance they ran on, I uh, would say it's probably like three, four miles. Okay. Mm. Yeah, but it's definitely the, the beautiful part of the race, which all runners run on uh, any distance. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, after the glacier, they have a big descent, uh, descent down to the valley, which does a second suspension bridge coming up which they then cross um, all the way to the valley, down to the green, to the cows, oh. to the trees. <laughs> nice. <laughs> to the little villages, uh, run through that. And um, yeah, and then going on, just another pass over another big mountain. Uh, and uh, they go up to, uh, it's called an, it's, uh, it's actually called Brighthorn, which that's a pretty hard, hard, part of the race uh, it's just going up and uh, yeah they um, go on top of Brighthorn and then uh, go over to this called a place called Roosevelt uh, beautiful um, views obviously like into the valley mm -hmm. coming back and uh, towards the last suspension bridge which uh, yeah all runners go through that too and then towards the finish line I guess you can't be afraid of heights if you want to do this race. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it helps if you're not. But in all fairness, like I heard stories which are really amazing. There was a, a Canadian runner, a female, and she's really afraid of heights. Mm -hmm. So at the start, she approached me and uh, she showed me this glass. So I'm like, what's that? And she's like, put it on. So I put it on and I couldn't see my fingers like this, like. So it, it blurs out everything in just a short distance. So she's like. I'm going to wear this on the bridge so I don't see anything, you know, just oh, wow. right in front of me. Oh, my but gosh. Then, interestingly, I saw a race course video of some runner made and she joined him and, uh, yeah, she never used it. So, oh. so I guess, yeah, a lot of people say, like, they're just look forward and uh, because they're fairly narrow, so you mm -hmm. can kind of hold it left and right. And so, yeah, it's possible, like, a big a good friend of mine from California, he's very afraid of fights. He did it. My wife did it. She's afraid too. So if you see the finish line in front of your eyes, no, you're definitely going to do it for sure. Yeah. And do some of the runners like, or most of the runners go through the suspension bridges at night? Um, it, yeah, it could be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it depends how fast or slow you are. Mm. It's, it's very hard to say, like, all the distances are a little different. And some of the 160K go through the, during the day, some are go during the night. It all depends on your speed. Because mm. if you think about it, the 160K, like, the first finisher is, like, 26 hours. And the <laughs> last finisher is 49 hours. So it's 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 a big, big, big gap. gap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Speaking of 49, 49 hours, that's probably when I'll be coming in. <laughs> but, uh, but you will be coming in. <laughs> how do you comfort the runners who come in after 49 hours? Uh, so far, it didn't happen. Wow. I know. <laughs> it's, as, as a runner myself, it's, it's really hard. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm very tough on cutoff. Like, if, every aid station has a cutoff. And, if you're there a minute late, that's unfortunately it is because if you're already late there, then it just mm -hmm. that's Snowballs. a snowball effect. Yeah, so, yeah, that's my biggest fear. Is like if somebody works so hard, puts all this energy, pain, suffering, and sleep deprivation, and <laughs> comes to the finish line ten minutes late. I don't know. It's tough, is, you know. Tough, late, tough but call. It be devastating. But people just drop before. People just drop at the last aid station if they. Mm -hmm. I think like 
it's kind of like planned that if you make it to the cutoff on the last aid station, you really have to slow down a lot not mm -hmm. to make it to the finish or, you know, injure yourself or so if, if, if you just keep moving a decent pace, you'll, you get there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. And, uh, this all started in 2017. So how did the first year go? Um, it was good. Uh, we decided to, because I, I'm like, let's put everything out there. 50, 100, 150. But uh, now I've been advised just to go slow. So at the first year, we had an 80 kilometer distance mm. and a half marathon, actually. Smart. So that was that. And then for the 80 kilometers, we had 50 runners. Mm -hmm. And um, everything went pretty good. Like uh, a group of runners got lost. For a while and then they got late and we decided to grant them 15 more minutes to the cutoff just to make it but the, it was a total different course it was a point to point different start different finish like right. it was a total different race back then mm. but it, it went good yeah yeah that uh, good feedback and and it was a uh, yeah it was interesting because i had a pretty good knowledge on race directing in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I got this. I can do this. No worries. <laughs> yeah, I was I was so wrong because it's a it's a totally different mentality. It's it's like very different. In Europe, yes. Very different. Oh yeah. Like for example, yes. point to point. Mm -hmm. Here it's good. The big races point to point they're, they're really popular. Not so much in Switzerland. They mm -hmm. for some reason like loops and stuff. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have showers at the finish, you're in trouble in Switzerland as a race director. <laughs> I learned that. Uh, I've done over, I've done 108 ultra marathons and I had two showers and finish. <laughs> That's <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah, so I, it's, that was a big learning curve, but you go along and, and you just, every day, every year you just learn and grow. And the key is just to be able to adapt just listen and uh, yes. make it as good as you possibly can. If I show up at your race, 100 miler, with a handheld, would you let me go with just one handheld? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> really? <Yeah. laughs> no mandatory uh, gear. Oh, 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 it's nothing else? <laughs> <laughs> nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I think um, what, what we do differently, like the first, year so 2017 and 18 i i didn't do mandatory gear another thing i learned right <laughs> and it was funny because i qualified for utmb maybe six seven years in a row but i never went because i'm like that's i'm not gonna carry all that stuff are they <laughs> Why? no way right but then 2018 i, I really learned the lesson because it, the race started with um, sprinkling on the forecast was supposed to open up during the day. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately not. It was a total whiteout. And yeah, so one runner and, and one of the first aid station topless. And, you know, it's like, and then everything was going bad and two, everything snowed in. Course material was like blown away. So mm. thankfully we were able to get everybody down pretty quick. We had to, I had to cancel the race. Oh, no. Mm. Yeah, after 12 hours, I had to pull the cord because we had some cases of frostbites. And mm. so, so no good. So lesson truly learned um, from there on, we have mandatory gear. Yeah, hmm. of course. Yeah. Of course. And then obviously the first year in 2019, everybody have to take it out and show it on a table, like how they do. Yeah. then in... 2020 was canceled, obviously, like everything else in life. And then uh, 2021, uh, we decided to, because we could open the, the race very limited. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, the, in order to be safe, we said, don't show us your material, like your mandatory gear. Just you have to sign a paper that you will always take a video. Right. And uh, let's carry it. So, and then mm -hmm. uh, we talked with the team and uh, we actually kept this going and we probably gonna keep that going for good because to me 
it's like if you want to cheat the system and I can just bring everything to the check-in and show it and on the race day I don't bring my jacket mm -hmm. and gloves, yes, right yes, yes. Um, yeah we we do um have like checkpoints along the course to check it but yeah so Honor for that system. reasons like mm -hmm. yeah we just have them sign it for also for us for liability that mm -hmm. they're required and they understand they have to have it and and hopefully everybody does and i think they do because mm -hmm. yeah the weather can get pretty fast bad in alps yeah and and i think people from europe understand that it's us north americans traveling to european races that maybe need a little bit of a lesson on that because it it does change so rapidly, especially in the Alps. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I could be like, I visit Switzerland. It's like blue sky. And I'm like, oh my God, it's beautiful. In 20 minutes, it's like oh, just cows, like rain, clouds. <laughs> it goes, it comes fast. Yeah. yeah. And you're also allowed so, pacers on your, on your race, right? Yeah. Yeah. To me, again, just racing in the United States, that was just so normal. Actually, I didn't even realize that other races don't really typically do that in the United States, uh, in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, to me, that's just, I mean, for the safety of the runner, it's good. Uh, yeah. Also, like, it's it's a it's a beautiful course. So if they can share something with somebody going along, then I think it's it's a it's a beautiful thing. Mm. That's a nice feature for yeah, sure. Well, there's many races in Europe that don't allow pacers. Well, Europeans, they're confused when they come to North America and going, what? I'm going to have someone pace me? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and we've heard that through many times when we chatted with European runners. Yeah. Well, it's cool because you're blending the best from North America and the best practices from Europe <laughs> and, and creating it together. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Now when... anything I go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I have some hair. <laughs> Don't worry, uh... I'll edit it out. <laughs> no, no, leave it in. That's awesome. It's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh... <laughs> no, yeah, definitely. Yeah. But I still have to make it better too. Like, for example, uh, I'm totally lagging on the award ceremonies. We don't do that. Mm. Yeah. Huh? It's just the guys who finish fast, they, I don't, you know, why should they stand around for 10 hours and wait for the award? <laughs> that's, oh, that's... you mean to do it at the end? Yeah. I, I can see that yeah. that would be a struggle. Yeah. Yeah. I, when we do awards in the AC 100, um, yeah, I get many comments that, you know, can we just have the plaque at the finishing? You just want to go home and I have to catch a flight, but yeah. 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 <laughs> but then uh, it's also nice to be recognized running this difficult course well and being in the top three. So maybe down the road we do an award ceremony, but maybe just fairly close after the first we finish. Right. Right. Yeah. Now in 2024, this year, the last time we checked, you had 39 countries represented including some Canadians. Yeah, that's amazing. That must be exciting. <laughs> it is, yeah. We expect up to 50, actually. Wow. Countries. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. Like, it turned out to be, um, which I never thought of it, but it's one of the, they call it vacation race. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which people just want to, because sometimes, like, you racing, right? And if I race, I just, even in San Diego, if I do 100 miles, I start driving at 2 in the morning and go to the start, check in and run and finish. And I did Havelina one year and I ran 100 miles, got in the car and drove home 360 miles. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, so that's just bang, bang, right? So, but in Switzerland, it's just so beautiful and there's so much to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many people just they come for a week or two weeks for a vacation and yeah, it's throw in a race, right? So then they run that during that weekend and then to have like the whole experience. Yeah. That's the best way to do it. Now, can you yeah. tell us about your green commitment for the race? We understand there's some yes. things that are involved with that. Absolutely. Yeah. That's something um just kind of near and dear my heart. Like um we just uh are at this point where we really have to be looking out for uh, you know environmental changes. Uh 
the the thing uh, which is um, against all this. 50 countries, wow, it sounds great, but also lots of flying, mm -hmm. lots of driving, lots of, you know, that kind of stuff. So we're trying to do the right thing with several things we do. For example, like when you register, you can opt to donate your T-shirt mm. to plant a tree. Okay. So six runners donate, that's one tree. So that money we give to almighty tree it's a uh, an organization in switzerland who does that so cool. last year we raised 715 dollars hmm. so they Great. planted uh, 22 trees i think yeah and this year we'll be off to an excellent start which is kind of funny i talked to almighty tree the Gilliard is his name and then i told him like i want to do it but honestly I don't think this is going to work like mm. because it's like it's one of those races which a lot of people do their best race like that event of the year they want right. to make it home so you just want to have that t-shirt as a souvenir but yeah I was, I was wrong people really do that so that's that's a great thing yeah yeah another thing we do we avoid plastic mm -hmm. a lot uh like we don't well obviously runners have to have their own uh drinking cup yes if they want soda cold drinks and stuff in aid stations because we don't want to like give out because if i have like 700 runners 13 aid station i mean you do the math it's a lot of trash mm -hmm. so we don't yeah. want to do that and then we have food we have hot soups and stuff so obviously we provide stuff to drink and they're all non-plastic and uh, easily sourced and uh, easily decomposed so we actually spend a little bit of money on that but it, uh, and also like we get it from a source in switzerland a company which is yet another price point and i could get it in china right but then right. shipping everything i mean that's that's really it's not the case uh another thing we do is like course marking uh, we mark courses and especially like i see in in the United States, you mark course and then you you clean up and there's this pile of trash from mm -hmm. the marking. So we use um a lot. We use uh, about two and a half thousand flags and about a thousand five hundred ribbons. So the flags are made out of uh, bamboo sticks and mm. and uh, a, a solid good uh, uh, flag on top. Okay. So we use them about ninety five percent every year. Nice. So they stick it in, the race goes on, they clean it up, we put it together, use it again. And the same with the ribbons. We have um, um, fabric ribbons. Actually, mm -hmm. I use the fabric ribbons they use for safety clothing. So they're really reflective at night. Okay. So we have these long ribbons and I put a, a little, um, those clamps you can use for um, mm -hmm. hanging stuff. Yeah. Like, so... We use those and those that come back 100%. We pretty much reuse them year. They're never going to go bad. So that's awesome. That's a big, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We all, we all have to do our part to try to reduce garbage and offset carbon as much as we can, yes. you know. And I'm sure there's going to be uh, new ways every year to do that. Yeah. Yeah. A friend, a good friend of mine, Thu is her name. She's, um, She's Vietnamese living in New York and uh, she's the director of sustainability mm -hmm. and she, that's what she does for a living. And she's amazing. She, we are working on be uh, carbon neutral next year or oh, this year, possibly like we do that. And uh, we talk to the public transportation in Switzerland because the big races, they get uh, free train rides with their bibs. Oh, wow. Uh, unfortunately, you have to have uh, at least a thousand participants to be considered. Mm. That. And, or, obviously, it's not free, right? But we get a huge reduction on the price. And that would be good, too, because then they they could basically fly to Zurich and then take the train for free to the start. Be, that would be amazing. Wow. What a great thing yeah. to promote. Oh, Jeez. I hope that works out for you. <laughs> yeah, wow. yeah. Well, we're... We're right on target. Uh, we are just about 300 registrations, and uh, we are like double speed in registration than last year. And we had 700 last year, so I think a thousand this year might wow. be happening. That's amazing. 
How long does it take to set up these these courses? To a uh, market? Yes. Uh, it takes about two days. That's oh, it, eh? Okay. Wow. Good. Yeah, I just go out there and I mark everything. I'm just so good at it. <laughs> <laughs> We have a whole team. Uh, it's like we have a team of uh, nine different teams, which uh, we distribute evenly, like different sections they mark. Mm -hmm. And it's basically people coming back year after year to do that. So, so they really know how to mark well. And uh, I'm particularly picky in marking. Like mm -hmm. nothing drives me crazier than a race which is not marked well. Yes. Yep. So so, but um, I had the best teacher in course marking, the race director from San Diego, Scotty. Mm. He's 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 crazy crazy on that. So he <laughs> even goes out and remarks it. No, this ribbon has to be there, not here. So, <laughs> so but it's good, right? And I created a whole uh, website just for marking, which my markers are reviewing, and it has all these guidelines and all these. Um, things i want them to follow so right. it's universal to, not like somebody's marking this way somebody's marking mm. that way so it's mm -hmm. pretty universal yeah so so far so good and people i mean runners get lost that's always going to be the case sure but, um, but you're reducing it but, tremendously by doing it consistent yeah, yeah. exactly and we just we just watch it every year because like for example, like when you start the race in the first aid station, just off the first aid station, there's a big split. Mm -hmm. The 160 goes straight, the rest go right. And then, yeah, like uh, 2022, we have live trackers so we can follow the runner live, real time. Every 10 seconds, it's renewed. Okay. So we're watching the 160 and then, of course, one went wrong and how it is like everybody just follows everybody. <laughs> so we had a whole bunch of so we started uh, putting signs there. So every year we just see problem so zones. I, there was a big s problem in, in one part of the course, which there's also split, and and in, it's down in a in a in a village. And somebody thought it was funny to take away the sign. Oh. So yes. a lot of confusions. <laughs> so I actually changed the course um, to avoid that section. Mm -hmm. So we we just kind of work on that. And um, uh, speaking of getting lost, I think uh, one of the really neat features, I think nobody else does. Like we have a, we have like a a team who kind of keeps an eye on the runner, mm -hmm. and by requirement you're supposed to have a cell phone reachable at at your run. Mm -hmm. So if we see somebody go wrong, uh, we can tell right away on the map because it's all tracked. We actually, we call them. We call them up and we tell them, uh, "Hey, buddy, you're going the wrong way." And that is it's kind amazing. of a, yeah. We got some good reaction. They're like, uh, "How do you know?" Like, <laughs> no, no, we know. We see you. Just turn around and down at the course. You know, make a left and so on. Yeah. So, so that's uh, that's that's pretty neat. I think that's awesome. That is good. That is something. <laughs> yeah. I got kind of lost a few times in my races, and hey, nobody called me. So. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds yeah. me of the time that norm was in uh leadville leadville norm was in leadville and i was at home in orangeville ontario and it was probably one o'clock in the morning and my phone rings and they he had put me down his as his emergency contact so they said oh yeah we're just calling about runner bib number 240 um have you have you we're wondering if he's off off Mount Hope, was it? Yep. Have you seen him lately? <laughs> I'm like, uh, well, first of all, I'm <laughs> in Canada. And secondly, <laughs> according to your app, he went through there three hours ago. So why are you calling oh. me? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, that's a good one, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Now I'm curious, Jacob, what is the fly event within your race? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And that's very interesting. Um, I have um, in 2017, um, one guy, Mark, he ran the 80 kilometer race of mine. I didn't know him back then. Mm -hmm. uh, he finished, and uh, and, uh, and uh, it was kind of funny because when in 2019, when I scouted the new start and finish line, mm -hmm. I 
ran portion of the course and then I I got to that point where where the start finish line is going to be and he was there and he's like hey I ran your race so I'm like oh so we started talking and we kind of really became good friends and along the way he helped me a lot because I I uh I just you know when I go there typically I don't take care of myself I don't eat I don't sleep and stuff so he kind of forced me to eat and stuff like that so truly good good guy and he he's a paraglider so mm -hmm. like one year he approached me he's like why don't you do a hike and fly kind of those have not exist in Switzerland it's just purely hike and fly right and then I'm like I don't know like I to me, I don't know how to do that because I'm not a flyer and I don't know the rules and regulations. It sounds really dangerous to me, right? <laughs> so he said, no, he would like to be the race director for that division. And I'm like, yeah, perfect. So, so yeah, it's really interesting. Like, those guys are actually pretty crazy because they get there are two divisions, like a 10-hour division and a 24-hour division where they start on, uh, on uh, oh, when is it? Uh, oh, Saturday. At 11 o'clock, they start okay. mandatory. They have to go up to the first aid station. They carry everything. They have like wow. about 20 pounds of gear. Yeah. So they carry up. And then they start flying and they can just, from there on, just do the thing, right? So you can just go fly back down to the valley and run to the finish and that's it. Or go, you know, fly over to the other side and run up the mountain to that aid station, and fly, you know. So whoever gets the most elevation changes kind of wins oh wow that is so cool yeah, I never heard of that it, i know i didn't either but yet it is popular there right it's very popular and, and, and by accident and i didn't even knew that back then it's like the where they start finishes apparently it's the mecca of uh paragliding in switzerland <laughs> wow. Wow. so because the mountains are so ideal ideal for mm -hmm. flying so, yeah yeah if you if you go to switzerland in that area and it's summer and it's it's nice weather i mean sky is full of paragliders it's, wow. it's very popular mm -hmm. that's so cool it's, those guys are amazing like they're in great shape uh what they do it's just unbelievable mm -hmm. that's neat and frankly it looks really funny like because we all track them or two right so they have a life tracker yeah and then we see them and then you see something falling down the mountain and you just hope it's a flyer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you hope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting to look at that stuff. What are your long-term goals for this race, the Swiss Alps 100? What, where do you see this in 10 years? Uh, so I, I want to get really rich and then I... I <laughs> No. That is every director's dream. And not going to happen. No, no. I mean, I don't want to work for free, but uh, I tell you, um, it, it, it doesn't pay the work I put in, for sure. <laughs> anyway, so I, uh, it's a, for me, it's a big goal to keep it as kind of family friendly, like kind of like lay back ish, not too much like professionalism, right? Of course. Yeah safety of course like you know give the runners a good experience i mean we offer like a lot of fresh food and aid station and stuff and, and uh but also like if we keep growing and growing like we already decided that we're gonna have a cutoff somewhere even though we're not required we could have like three four thousand runners mm -hmm. but you know if i look at utmb it's like oh <laughs> it's like even when I run Leadville, uh, that year it was just uh, some company took over and they, they just got yes, everybody in on yes, it. Yes. I remember getting to the first aid station, I had to wait in line. It's like, yeah. oh, what's going on, right? So that I don't want that to happen, really. So just keep it, yeah, very professional and um, keep it um, uh, safe. Safety is always number one, obviously. Uh, yeah. But also keep that feel of family, like... I'm very approachable. Uh, everybody knows my contact information. I get a lot of emails from runners with questions, and and and, and yeah, they, uh, they can always approach me and and ask me stuff. Obviously, and it's great. Yeah, it's like I'm always at the finish line from 
Saturday at 10 o'clock for 24 hours straight. Wow. Because every runner who finish, I want to welcome my personally mm -hmm. and just give them what they deserve. And because it's very inspiring to me. I know what they go through because I've been there so many times myself. Uh, yes. <laughs> I've done like 26 uh, on the my races. And uh, and uh, it's just it's just a great motivation like it's really it's really beautiful to see them come in and experience that and they're so happy and everything so mm -hmm. yeah keep it friendly and uh, not too big mm -hmm. like uh i think uh overall maybe around 1200 participant we're gonna pop it like 300 per distance right if we get that far so yeah <laughs> that's the goal nice wow yep so which I guess that would be your favorite part of being a race director is the finish line and everybody coming in. Exactly. It's like, so I work through the year, basically almost every day on it because I just, there's so much I want to do and I want to create this um, family. It's kind of called Swiss100family.com, which we allow runners to have their own account. When you register, you get an account automatically and you can get in there you can put up pictures, you can write stuff. So mm -hmm. I want runners to kind of be able, first of all, to interact with each other before the race. Some ran it already so they can talk about it. And Or if you run with somebody, like, it happens to me all the time. I, I run a race and, and I run with somebody and it was just great. You know, we just keep me talking and everything. And when I finish, I forgot the name because I yes. was tired. I just remember <laughs> B15, but... <laughs> that doesn't help anymore so that would help to kind of be able to find each other again and stuff so mm. yeah so yeah i work uh, a lot on it and then coming close to race day um it gets hectic really hectic and uh, like i'm there two weeks before race start uh so it's just lots going on <laughs> and then when i hit that 10 o'clock a.m. Saturday. It's just like, just, and the, finally I can earn the fruits from all, all that. So <laughs> that's going to be kind of me time. To, yes. To really enjoy that and and wow. just lean back and just, I don't have to work on it. I just, I sit here and just have a good time. <laughs> As you should. <laughs> and of course, we can reach you through all of your socials, right? The Swiss Alps 100 and on all socials. Right, yeah, we're in uh, Facebook, um, Instagram. We used to be an X, formerly Twitter. Uh, <laughs> we, for now, we decided it's just not to post anymore. But yeah, well, you, of course, you can go on the website. You click on organization, the team tag, and then you see all the team. And there's I'm there too with my email address. Very good. Now. The important question, Jacob, when are you coming to Canada? <laughs> uh, well, you have to you have to lure me in with a great race, you know, up there. I, I, I don't know any races up there. I've been there once, like a while ago, I used to work for Disney and then we acquired some websites in Toronto. So they sent me up there. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, I did my thing. And then I was pretty sad because I learned that that weekend was a race, like a 50K, and then it started Saturday. And Saturday morning, I, f I flew back to California, and I tried to change my ticket. It didn't work, so Aww. I missed that race. Too but, bad. But, yeah, if there's a there's something nice to do, like a good kind of ultra marathon with not too much snow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. There's a short window yeah. of opportunity for that. <laughs> May to oh, yeah. October. May to October. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Depending on what yeah. part of Canada. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But we'll we'll stay in touch and keep you posted about that. But I think you would I think you would find uh that Canada's very similar to Switzerland in many ways. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Very it's similar. Quite yeah. beautiful and um People are so beautiful too. They're so friendly, and uh, yeah, I would definitely love to explore it a little more down the road. Well, that would be interesting because you're going to eventually take become the race director of the Angels. One, Angelus. 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 <laughs> Angelus. 
We have such a hard time remembering that you just pronounce it like Los Angeles. I don't know why. <laughs> so you could be a race director of the U.S. somewhere in California, USA, and then a race director in, in Switzerland. And then if you become a race director in Canada, that would be interesting. Race directing in three different countries. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. I'm I'm looking at the race in Australia. I want to maybe put on. So there you Ooh. go. Yeah. There you go. Wow, <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, an interesting idea. I saw down there. So something unique. Uh, nobody does. So maybe. Okay. All right. Well, if anything, you you might see us in Switzerland first. <laughs> it would be beautiful. Yeah, I would totally love to welcome you. I'll introduce you some really good pizza. <laughs> and thanks so much for uh, after we chatted with Aaron Shimmons, you you reposted our podcast with him and our chat with him. And uh, yeah, that, this is how we learned about your race, obviously. Oh, perfect. Awesome. Yeah, he great guy. I mean, uh, I was stoked to hear that he's come run the race and uh, talked to him at the race. And uh, and now I'm. Um, Aaron, we're still waiting for the video. Chop, chop. <laughs> so, uh, That's right. Yeah, he does yeah, take a little yeah. bit of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he promised in December, so maybe he meant 2024. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, de it definitely takes time, and he's so busy doing his uh, podcast now, too. So, yeah, a great guy. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Well, before we let you go today, we're going to finish off with some rapid fire questions. Okay. Are you ready? Oh boy, maybe. <laughs> What's a TV show that you're embarrassed to say you watch? <laughs> oh my God, I don't watch so much. Um, I don't know. Well, for a while, my wife wife made me watch uh, 90 Days Fiance. So. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that, that no. qualifies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You always offered wine, so that helped. <laughs> <laughs> Star Wars or Star Trek? Oh, uh, Star Wars. Star Wars. Nice. Yeah. Uh, do you have any tattoos? I do not. However, nobody knows that, so I'll let it out right now. Um, what I'm going to do when we get close to maybe get a thousand runners. Yeah. What I'm going to do is like, as soon as we hit a thousand runners, I tattoo the logo on my calf. Very wow. cool. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. I imagine yeah. you designed it, so that's that's very appropriate. I did not. Oh, you did it? <laughs> I, think I had a different logo in the beginning, but okay. it was just so I thought like, yeah, I I just invest some money and have something done which I like and that has happened. So Okay. Logo is so important to be recognized. So you're running on the trail and you stub your toe on a rock. What do you say in German? Ah, oh, that's a mouthful. That is exactly what I say. <laughs> that is a mouthful. Yeah, I like it. What does it translate yeah, to mean? <laughs> say again. What does it translate to mean? Oh, it's so it's it's, it's not German. German. It's like Swiss German. Okay. So it's with a German huge accent, but it just means like God, uh, God, you know. God damn it. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds very uh uh what's the word? Um harsh? Or... No, it sounds like that's appropriate. I don't know. I'm not I can't think of what I'm trying to say. <laughs> it sounds better yeah. than just saying yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah. Uh seventies, eighties, or nineties music. Now eighties. I used yeah. to be um when I grew up I between 15 and 25 years old, I used to be DJ. Oh. Just on the weekend, just for fun, just being that goofy kid. And uh, yeah, 80s all the way. Absolutely. I'm with you there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, Norm, final question. Hey, pick a superpower that you'd like to have. Ooh, so many to pick. Um, I don't know. I guess being able to make people happy just by looking at them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's you a happy. good one. That's unique. You happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I think that would bring on world peace for sure. <laughs> I'll be really busy though. Have you yeah, long you, line? you would be. Yeah. <laughs> All just, right, Jacob, thank yeah. you so much. This has been awesome. Thank you guys. Yeah, no, it's been fun. Thank you for having me. We hope to uh, meet in person one day. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, if, if you don't want to come to boring Switzerland, I come to exciting Canada. <laughs> <laughs> well, the invitation's open, so let's keep in touch, okay? That sounds good. Thank you, guys. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Cool. <laughs> Bye. Bye. That was Jacob Herman, race director of Swiss Alps 100. That race sounds breathtaking. 49 hours. That's a kick-ass race. Absolutely. <laughs> and, but, wow, what do you see? A glacier? <laughs> I would love to run on a glacier. Yeah, I hope you're going to... The three suspension bridges. Yes. Which... Things normally feel rubbery on a suspension bridge. Can you imagine doing it after 80 miles? Well, would you cross... A, it's, I think these suspension bridges are 500 feet long. I don't know if it's in feet or meters. I don't know. Nevertheless, would you cross one at night? Yeah, because I can't see what I'm about to fall into. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, I think I'd rather. I don't know about those blurry glasses on her eyes situation. Oh, yeah, yeah. I might take off my glasses so I can't see well, but I don't know about obscuring my view that much. Right. Yeah, that but yeah, I think I would rather do it at night. No, I would obviously love to. But you miss the view. Yeah, I yeah. would definitely do it in the day. Yeah. I would try to get there to see it. So if I'm in a situation where, oh my, no, it's, the sun is setting and I got to get to that suspension bridge because I want to <laughs> get good pictures <laughs> or just hang out until the rise, sun rise again. Take the full 49 yeah, hours. It, yeah, you're right. Well, if it's, if I'm at the bridge and I, the sun's going to rise in 30, 40 minutes, I would, mm. I would stick around. Yeah, maybe. Why not? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good strategy there. Love it. Uh, yeah, and then of course it's he's making it very green with all his no plastics. Yes. And uh as his race just should moving yeah. forward. Yeah. Yeah. And he's put a lot of thought into this race and he wants to keep it low key-ish, which is great. And of course, qualifying for Western States, hard rock, bad water, all there. Yeah, it's pretty epic. You gotta sign up because in the future it's gonna this race is gonna sell out quick because of that. I think so. I think you're right. But before you go, please head on over to the platform that you're listening to us on and give us a quick review, rate, rating, whatever it is. Do it, please. <laughs> Much it really, appreciated. It really helps. Until next time. Bye. Cheers. <laughs>